Welcome to Ordinary to Badass. Whether you're ordinary or badass, I am so glad you're here. Today's guest is Steph Hilfer. Steph, thank you so much for being here. Excited to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So before we go any further, I've got to ask you, do you consider yourself ordinary or badass? You know, I would say, I would say badass, but I don't, I don't want that to take away from how badass ordinary is either. (laughs) Why do you say that? (laughs) Well, I think, you know, especially with what I do, you know, so many of us are uncomfortable being our or quote unquote ordinary self because they don't see how badass that really is. You know, so much in our world has got gotten, you know, as a blessing authentically, like everything is going to real and raw and authentic. And I think in the past, ordinary seemed boring, but, you know, just being real and who you are to your audience and to, to the people who want to connect with you for whatever reason you're in the world, that's not ordinary. That's like, yes, there's someone like me, (laughs) you know? So I think that's why my answer is badass, but don't make you think that ordinary is not badass. So have you always embraced the ordinary or is that something that has come with time? Ooh, I don't think I've always embraced it for sure. I really think being a business owner and in doing branding like I do has been such a catalyst for helping me see that just being, whether it's ordinary, whatever my ordinary is, just how special that is. Uh, so no, absolutely not. I think I, I, I don't think, I know I still struggle. I mean, even with my husband, sometimes I'll start what I call geeking out on anything, right? I mean, the other day we went to Jimmy John's and because of, you know, so many of the world changes, our straws are going to like paper instead of plastic. And we went to Jimmy John's, a sandwich shop where I live, and their brand colors are black, red, and white. Well, our straws were green. And I started geeking out about how do you think the marketing department would freak out about these green straws? And anyway, I'm geeking out and being my normal self. And my husband's like, oh my God, you're such a dork. (laughs) Yes, I love that. And I think that there is something to say about like, appreciating who you are, appreciating where you're at in your journey. And I know for much of my life, I've spent it like, oh, when I'm there, then I'll feel this way. And it's like, no, the beauty is in the right now. And if you don't appreciate now, you're probably not going to appreciate it later when you have the thing. Well, yeah. And I think I see this a lot. And I listened to one of your recent podcast interviews um, and we were talking about, you know, weight loss and diets and, and what our physique looks like. And to that exact point, when we put it in that perspective, or even think about it in business perspective, don't we all look back to our like 10 years ago or 20 years ago self and wish we had like seen all we had then? Yeah. You know, I, tr- I think I try to think of that, you know, all the time in, in many assets of my life, be like, oh, I just wish that 10 years ago when I had, you know, the, th- the 27 year old body that I was running around a little more confidently than I am now in my little 37 year old body. So, so yeah, I I agree with that for sure. Okay. So this episode has already started off so good. I can't wait (laughs) to dive into it, but first will you tell us a little bit about yourself? (laughs) Yes. Um, Well, my name is Steph and I own Vim. Vim is a branding agency and Vim we, you might've heard Vim in your English language before, and it's, it's always associated with Vim and Vigor. Like she's full of vim and vigor and uh, it's a play on a couple things. So one, I, I love the enthusiasm and high spirited uh, actual definition of the word vim, but also it is an acronym for what we do. Uh, we do branding and we focus on visual, intentional, integrated marketing. So um, that's a little bit about my business. I live just South of Seattle Um, I love to make sure people know I'm not in the city of Seattle. I'm looking at a pig pen right outside my office. (laughs) I am in the country and I love it. Uh, We, I have a dog and we go out and hike and do all the outdoorsy things that any, any stereotypical Pacific Northwesterner does. (laughs) So I guess that's me in a nutshell. (laughs) There we go. And we have that in common because I'm in Washington state as well. (laughs) 
That's right. And tell me where in Washington state you are. In Tacoma, Washington. That's right. Not we should have just done this at a coffee shop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not far at all. Oh. Yeah, I'm in Enum class. So just oh, on okay. the way to Crystal Mountain. There you go. That's really close. Um, yes. So what led you to get into marketing? Well, I didn't know that marketing was a career path. I, I just kind of naturally always had this marketing brain. Um, if I really look back at my you know, upbringing, it was when I was around 10 or so, um, this moment hit me. I didn't think of it or associated it with like a career or anything, but it, it really is the first moment I can look back to and realizing like, oh, my brain has something weird here. And I didn't even think of this until like 20 years later. But when I was 10, uh, there was a neighborhood in um, growing up in Washington there was a neighborhood that had a very poor reputation. Um, it had a nickname and everything and people who lived there, all of it, just a really rough, rough reputation. And outside the neighborhood, there is a sign that introduces the name of the neighborhood. And um, I always thought if you just sanded it down, gave it a fresh coat of paint, you know, really outline the letters so that it was really clear, you know, the name of the neighborhood, that that alone would change the reputation of this neighborhood. And while we know that that's not a thousand percent true, it was a very interesting thought for a 10 year old to be really thinking, right? Um, so I really think if I think back, I think that's some of the earliest days where I'm, I was associating what we visually consume versus what we be internally believe to be true has an association. Um, but then from there, you know, my first job, I was a, what we called guest relations, which is a fancy word for receptionist. <laughs> and uh, it was there that my employers really gave me a shot to create this silly little newsletter. Um, I remember it was a hair salon and we sold makeup. I even took little samples of the lipstick and like spread it on the paper so you could see the shimmer and everything. Um, but yeah, it was there that my first, you know, marketing brain got to be used in a business sense. And it kind of just snowballed from there, you know, from marketing coordinator to marketing manager to marketing director to VP of marketing kind of thing. And then um, I started really honing in on my zone of genius with all of the companies I'd ever worked with, what it was that I just loved and realized I want to do this for more than just my employer. I really want to have more companies have the experience that I bring. And that's how Vim was born. So what led you to taking the leap to entrepreneurship? And was that terrifying? It probably would have... It, I guess, yes, it was terrifying. <laughs> I was like, hmm, was it? It was. And what really pushed me to make it happen was I had um, a colleague who I'd worked with in the past. Uh, we were both directors and she was really itching to start a company. So her and I went on a hike, right? Once again, went on a hike and I was in a full-time job feeling great about everything. And she was like, come on, let's do this. Let's start a business together. And I re remember literally saying, I don't, I don't have time for this. Like, <laughs> this is not what I have time for. And, uh, and, but she talked to me and we really, really got more and more into it. And I was like, you know what, let's do it. And I truly believe that if it wasn't for her pushing me to really make them happen, that, you know, I'm sure something would have happened, but I don't know if it would have been where we are today. Um, but I truly believe she was the catalyst to seeing this come to life. Um, she and I worked side by side when we started Vim in 2018 for just a couple months, and then decide she decided to move on to a different, you know, more formal career path. And so here I am, almost four years later, still rocking and rolling. It's funny how sometimes people show up in our life at certain points, and maybe she was never really meant to be in the business long term, but right. to push you to do what you're meant to be. So I love that. Yeah. Well, and I'd started, um, you know, hobby businesses, like quote unquote, um, I had had design by Steph or Steph photography, you know, some, some way of kind of tying in the marketing in one way, but they were always more, like I said, hobby, um, kind of side gigs. It wasn't until 
you know, she had really pushed me to go all in on this idea that I did that terror, that what was so terrifying about being, you know, all in, in the past, I kind of didn't have time to think about. Mm. (laughs) She kind of was like, let's just do it. So yeah, I agree. Earlier, you mentioned the idea of zone of genius, and I don't think everybody knows what that is. Will you talk a little bit about the zone of genius and what it is or how people can find it? Yeah. Well, I mean, for each of us, we do have like the general term of zone of genius is kind of just where you're naturally comfortable and execute a thing phenomenally, right? It might be in the kitchen. It might be baking versus cooking, or, you know, it might be speaking at an in events or do hosting podcasts. Um, so, you know, to me, like the term zone of genius is really where you feel the most naturally at home. I guess you can almost like kind of think of it as what we used to call a protege or, um, yeah, is that the right word? Where you're just like naturally born with these like talents. <laughs> um, but I don't believe that a zone of genius needs to just be that it always just comes so easy, right? There's this, there's a little bit that is the catalyst to have you, you know, naturally fit here, but there's, that does not mean that you don't continue to hone your skills and get better and better. Right. For me, my zone of genius is, is branding and, and sure branding kind of sounds boring, but it's this to get, what brings all of these things that I've throughout my life had a creative you know niche for like graphic design. Like I talked about with that newsletter, I dabbled in photography. I did some sales. All of these things kind of come together in my zone of genius of creating brands that are very beautifully visual, very intentional and strategic. And I really work on making sure that you integrate your brand throughout your marketing, not just here's my logo and I put it in the corner of my website and it's my profile picture but truly living and breathing all of the intentional and visual pieces of your brand throughout your marketing. Um, So that's my zone of genius. And I will be so honest that even, even as early as this year, I would stumble, I would stumble upon my words when I would try to save Vim as a branding agency, um, which I don't know why I actually can't wait for the moment when I can really tap into that, like why, but I always was like, I felt this pressure that I had to be a marketing agency and that, that maybe that's cooler has like a bigger persona. I'm not sure, but, um, even saying we're a branding agency, I still stumble (laughs) on my words. Um, but yeah, so that zone of genius doesn't always come naturally. And sometimes it's hard to like own that lane all the time. Yeah. And I like that you said that because oftentimes we see people on social media or, um, well, social media is a big part of it, but we think they have their lives all put together and like everything is perfect. Nothing is ever hard for Marie or for Steph, you know, like, um, they don't ever have any hardships, but the truth is there are probably hard things all along the way that you've went through and it's not all gumdrops and lollipops, but you still have pushed through it. For sure. Yeah. That, you know, like at the beginning, when we started talking about, you know, real and raw and authentic, um, I think we're getting to a better place where people can feel comfortable showing up on social in that way. But I mean, talk about one of the worst, like probably like take us back moments is when social, like, especially Instagram, cause it's so vis- It was such a visually impactful platform and I'm not dogging it at all, but it's so visually impactful. And we as consumers and humans, you know, absorb so much through the visual, um, that ugh, God, the first five, maybe 10 years of Instagram's like being, it was all this Insta perfect, you know? And so it just, I think really has taken, that's why being real, raw and authentic and maybe imperfect is starting to, to get traction. And we're starting to see the quote unquote algorithm helping us see more of that and rewarding more of that. So what do you do to avoid or uh, not run into the trap of being insta-perfect? 
well, I'm just plain and simply not perfect. <laughs> That's for one. Um, but I struggle with, um, I, I, I literally have a sticky note right here on my um, monitor that says progress over perfection, because I personally struggle with this feeling pressure or need, even in, on my own self to be, you know, perfect, especially with what I put out for my clients. Um, but I do think a lot of it is using social not to sell, um, but using social to be social. Uh, I really think if we go back to the root of why any social media platform starts, it's very, I mean, I can't, I'd love someone to tell me, hear this and tell me one because I'd love to know it, but I don't think there's a social media platform that came on to be like, let's just serve ads to people. I'm sure people are going to sign up for that. Like, right. no, <laughs> they're like, let's put a place that people can naturally socialize, be themselves um, or whatever version of themselves they want to come out with and, and connect. But so to me, like the way I avoid, you know, being insta perfect or, or trying to put that out as my goal is to just pretend that everyone on my feed is just a friend, not, not someone who's going to buy from me. Uh, maybe they learn from me, but Hey, I hope my friends are learning from me and sure. Maybe a sale comes from it, but more so my social reason for being on social is to just put who I am out there. And Hey, if you get some enjoyment out of it, you, you like my energy, maybe you learn something and you want to take it to the next level and we work together. Yeah, let's do it. But, um, I think if, if people started going back to the root of why social even exists and making that part of their strategy, I think a they'll enjoy it a whole lot more and B, I, I know you'll see better results. Yeah. And I like how you said, like, you try to think like, oh, that's my friend or that's my future friend, you know? And that's exactly what I did for this podcast. Cause I am a major introvert. <laughs> and so it was so hard for me um, in the beginning. And so that's what I'd say like, oh, this could be my future friend. Like I'm just talking to a friend here and it took away some of the nerves or the anxiety. Well, for sure. And I was just, just thinking about this today. Um, I was working on a proposal for a client, been with me for a couple of years. So, you know, just adding on to things. And I remember the first time I would write a proposal for this, wrote a proposal for this person, this, I felt like they were so big and I was so anxious about impressing upon this person. And not that, not that any one person is big or small. That's not what I mean. But I had these pressures of like, they were bigger than life or not just another human. Like you're just another human. I'm just another human. Take away all the labels, all the, you know, genders, all the titles, all the uh, wealth, all, you know, take it all away and just break us down to the most common denominator. And we're just two humans hanging out. Right. Right. And it, like, how much easier would things be? <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's hard though. It, it is really hard to, to get that out because our social structure has always taught us differently. Right. Yep. And it's time to buck the, the norm, buck the social structure, you know? Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about branding a little bit. Why is it important for, let's say, a small business, an entrepreneur to be, I know it's important for all businesses, but why is it important for them to be on point with their branding or have everything align with each other? Yeah, well, I think of branding. And, and when I say branding, this could be for a large corporate business. It could be for a solopreneur. It could be for, you know, a politician or somebody who's looking to raise awareness and just get signatures. It doesn't always have to be a brand, doesn't always have to be associated with a monetary gain. It can just be for um, a bigger mission, whatever that might be. We always associate branding with business and that's, that's, you know, expected, but I want people to also, it helps people think of this, this approach to branding a little easier when you take away the monetary piece sometimes. Um, I talk about branding as the foundation of a home. So I know not everyone's built a home or maybe don't, don't exactly know how it's built, but I can tell you that the very first thing that a home builder does is lay the foundation. They spend the foundation is one of the most expensive pieces to actually building a, a structure. 
Um, there's engineering, there's planning, there's con like hard costs and actually pouring this foundation. And if that is unstable or not thought out well, when you start throwing up walls, throwing in windows, doors, and a roof, you might have cracks, things might fall. You might have leaks when it rains. And so I think of branding like the foundation of a house because your marketing should be getting your brand out there. And if you start with your marketing before you actually know your brand, what are you actually putting out into the world? It might change throughout your campaigns and throughout your business years. You might lose sight of truly what your brand is. And when I say brand, I, uh, it's not, once again, just your logo. It's what we stand for. It's who we are, what we believe, what we sell, clarity around what we sell or what, what we're for, right? If we take out the business factor, like what's our mission at hand? Um, all of that needing to be truly defined and solid before we start putting it out in the world is what I think branding is. And based on what you said, I can assume that that will lead you to have a solid foundation for things going, things going forward. But what is the benefit that, aside from a solid foundation? Yeah. Well, um, what I thought you were almost going to say is like, when things go wrong, when things go wrong, like think about what we've been doing for the last two years, which is just trying to get through what none of us have ever experienced in, in the sense of a pandemic you know, having to be indoors, having to shift things from, you know, in person to online, um, having a brand gives you these decision-making principles that help you shift Bob and weave as the, the market bobs and weaves. So a really good example that I like to share when it comes to like having your brand as a decision-making principle is Southwest airlines. Um, this, I, I love to find this article one day, but it, I learned of it like 10 years ago. So Southwest Airlines, one of their core values, which is part of their brand, part of what they believe, their persona is humor. If you've ever, especially since you're from Tacoma, I know you know Southwest, but if any listeners know, Southwest Airlines definitely has several hubs over here on the West Coast, but they're very humorous. Um, they're known for their like sing song, almost rap. Um, stewardess kind of, you know, beginning announcements when you get on the plane, buckle your seatbelt, mask will fall down, that kind of thing. And um, in this article, they're one of the stewardess or um, flight attendants had actually gone through this whole rap sing song uh, dance. And one of the passengers found it very inappropriate, not the time and place. We shouldn't be joking or laughing about this. This is a serious matter, X, Y, and Z. Because the staff on the plane knew the brand and what they stood for, right? It wasn't just, you know, core values on a poster in the corporate office that none of them had seen before, or maybe heard once when they were hired. It was bled through their culture so strongly that even though one passenger was irate and threatening to, you know, never fly again, the whole staff knew we are not going to adjust who we are and what we stand for, for this one person who doesn't align and take it away from the other 149 passengers. Instead, we're going to stay in our lane, make the decision to allow that one person to exit if they need and never come back if they want. They're willing to lose a customer, which when we do put it in business perspective, no one wants to lose customers. But when you have a really solid brand that you can fall back to, to help your whole team make decisions or to help you hire based on, you know, alignment or disalignment on your, on who you are, it makes everything easier. You know, it makes it clear, easy. And the most amazing thing is now what we did is we attracted 149 passengers who are so up our alley. And we are going to reject this one, which is great because we don't want to spend time, energy, or our marketing budget on people who don't align with who we are. Um, so, I mean, those, that's just kind of one example of how having a foundation and a, a solid brand can help you just navigate your day-to-day -day business. Yeah. And I think even in your everyday life, 
if you know your foundation, if you know your values, what you stand for, it's like the haters or the people from the outside, it's not going to affect you as much because you already know what you stand for. Yeah. Well, and I know everyone thinks they want to be the Amazon of whatever it is they do, right? Everyone wants to be the Oprah of this or the Amazon of that. Okay. And, um, but even the Amazons and even the Oprahs know their audience and they don't try to attract the people who aren't their audience. They literally do things to repel those people, whether it's conscious or not, or or really great branding. Um, that's the goal is we only have, you know, in everyone's marketing budget, you only have so much, so much dollars. So why would we want to use even a dime of that? on somebody who isn't in alignment with us when we can just naturally put ourselves out there so clearly that the people who don't align with what we believe in just naturally weed themselves out. You know, right now, um, you know, with like politics being at the crazy, crazy hot, I mean, I don't know, for me at my my age, it feels so, so strongly divided. Um, and, And maybe it's always been that way. And I'm just finally like paying attention. But to me, it's very similar. Like, with a business, if you strongly believe, and if, if your choice is to strongly believe in politics, then speak it so loudly. And then, you know, I'm basically cutting half the people out, but the people who are my people, they're my people. And I know it and they know me. Um, that's just like one so obvious example right now, um, that you can think of when you're talking about like repelling or attracting audience members. So what do you do to stay grounded? Um, like, is there any type of, I don't know, meditation, hiking, those type of things that you do to stay grounded so that your other decisions in your business are a little bit easier? Yeah. Well, I struggled with that a lot. And um, I know that, you know, Kelsey Curtis, that's how we kind of got connected. And even though I do branding, um, it is always hard to do things for yourself. So I actually worked with Kelsey and she helped me really solidify our brand words and, um, it being grounded. I don't know if I was grounded. (laughs) I I feel like I'm still constantly working on that, but, um, I'd gone through this exercise with Kelsey and she'd listed several words. She usually recommends four or five at most words, but she had gone through my exercise and said, I had to give you six. And when you see the sixth one, I think, I think you will, understand why. And so we went through all my words and they were all resonating and they were all great. And then boom, my last words pops on the screen and I literally almost start crying. I think I did start crying and it was peace. And I started crying because it's not that I have peace, but it's something I'm seeking all the time. And that my other five words are such high energy go, 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 almost high strung words that I needed peace to ground me, you know? So I love that a it's in my branding. I also hope that it, people can recognize in their own brand, how important it is to be at peace with it. Um, but I do have to, I love that I get to work on that every day, hiking, meditation, those things, yoga and working out are all things that, um, I really do to ground me this year. One of the big things was doing exactly this, which was getting in front of people and talking again. Uh, The pandemic really got me. I'm a very, I'm like the opposite of you. I'm super outgoing, very loud. Clearly, I feel like this is pretty evident. Um, And I started feeling like not myself. And I found it was because I'm sitting here in my office, staring at my pig pen for the last two years, working away. And I was like, I need to get in front of more people, talk with people, get some of that social camaraderie and engagement back. Um, And this, this has been really grounding, like remembering there are other people who enjoy, you know, things that I enjoy and geek out about silly things that I geek out. That's been very grounding. So what was that moment that you realized, like, I got to do something new or I got to start connecting with people again, because I think it's so easy to get in those ruts and then hard to find a way out sometimes. Yeah. You know, it was a really, it's really silly, but the moment was, I was like, I think I've worn sweatpants and had my hair in a messy bun with no makeup on for two years now. 
And I know we all joke about that, but I was like, legit, I feel like a scrub. I just, I needed to do something. And so that was really a moment for me of being like, I need to get out of this comfort zone that I am in because I'm losing myself. Um, be, especially with my brand being such a visual brand, not just in what we execute, but, you know, me being the face of the brand and prior to, to COVID, you know, I would go to networking groups. I would meet with people. I would speak at large events and, uh, that was all lost. So, so yeah, I was really realizing how lazy I think I've gotten. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yeah. I got to confess. I same thing here in a lot of ways. Like I stopped curling my hair. Mm -hmm. I stopped wearing makeup because in Washington, we still have to wear masks. And so like, just like in this last week, I wore makeup or cover up and uh, blush for the first time in probably two years. Cause the, you know, I didn't want it rubbing off on the mask. I was like, what's the point? And then I was like, okay, you know, once the masks are off, I definitely need to go back to this just because it's like, something about how it makes me feel. And I kind of forgot about that until I tried it again. Yeah, you do. You forget about it because one, it was really, it was almost glorified, like the whole PJ, like from here on up or camera ready. Like, you know, I'm actually dressed today, but most of the times I'd throw on a nice ish top and have sweats on underneath. It was glorified that that was, you know, because we were all in that place and I'm not saying it's wrong, you know, do what you do, whatever that is comfortable for you but it wasn't my norm, you know, that wasn't my comfort zone. Um, and I was feeling like, like you said, you know, not myself. Right. So I can't believe that we're finally like, I mean, I guess this will, I don't know when this will air, but we're finally getting some of our Washington normalcy back. I think soon. Yes. (laughs) Woohoo. For sure. So I'm sure through everything that you've been through and creating your own business that, there have been things that have tested you along the way and what got you to the place that you are now confidence wise? Like, is there any tips or tricks that you have for confidence and mindset? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I know this is going to sound like, Oh, how perfect for a branding person, but really honing in on my values and what I believe in and living through those has really helped me get through some of the hard times Um, I'm sure you can understand this, you know, sometimes, uh, imposter syndrome pops up and you're like, am I really good at this? Like, is this, is this really good? Um, seeking validation all the time and having my words be like, be able to be my check and balance or being like, you know what, you just need to step away and you just need to go find whatever peace looks like for you. Um, or, you know, recognize that, you're always going to be striving for excellence because that's one of our core words and get yourself back to that. Okay. When you did the same thing a year ago, you never would have thought you would be where you are today. You know, um, I also think seeing that failure is okay. Like I, I truly believe that there is no such thing as failure and that all failure is truly just an opportunity to learn. Um, I was talking to my brother recently and I was like, what is the worst case scenario? Really? What's the worst case scenario? Whatever, whatever thing we're stressing out about, you know, is that you're going to lose your job and then you can't afford to pay for your house. And then you're, you, you don't have your house anymore and you have to sell it. Um, you know, if that's the worst case scenario, I, my brother and, and most of us, you know, have people, you know, you, you turn to your mother, your father, or you turn to a loved one or a friend, or you tune to the system and the options that are there, but there's the worst case scenarios often aren't as detrimental as we make them out to be in our, in our minds. Um, you know, and I, and I don't want to discredit or disregard that there are a lot of worst case scenarios that are very scary, but majority of the time we're thinking, Oh, if I don't check that email today, the world will end. Well, I'm I'm sorry to say that that's not true. (laughs) Like I can't think of any position where if you forget to check your email, the world truly ends. Um, so that's also been a really good reminder to get me through. I mean, some of it literally it'll, it'll be like a high one day and the low is low the next day. It's so roller coastery, and I'm sure you get that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and is there like a 
practice you have for your values or getting in touch with your values or making sure that you update them or remember what they are? Yeah. Well, I, I have them everywhere. I have them on a sticky note. And I mean, as not beautifully written, just slapped on a sticky note. Um, all of my monitors, I have like, you know, just the background image instead of being a you know cute mountain or whatever, I have my words and I have the reasons those are our words. Um, I keep them in front of me at all times as, as like a gut check. Um, the background of my phone even, right? Because we check that a thousand times a day. Um, and talking about them, that's really, you know, while I talk about, you know, all of the branding and I say I'm a branding agency, but marketing is in my name. That's because when we are integrating what's visual and intentional for us, that is that constant reminder of who we are and what we believe. You know, if you're, if you make these, your, you know, brand and decide your values and your message and your persona, but then you just go to sell, sell, sell and put my things that I sell all the time up there and never come back and bleed your brand through, then that is where I know that those brands and those businesses don't succeed. Uh, and I don't want to say that they don't like, that sounds too like assume, assuming everyone won't succeed, but the majority of the businesses who do that, eventually the consumers just fall flat. They find someone else who aligns with them more. And you might've aligned with them all along. You just didn't put that out there because you were focused on buy my cheeseburger, buy my cheeseburger, buy my cheeseburger, instead of talking about, you know, why your cheeseburger is amazing and this people behind it and the, the small businesses you connect with that, um, you know, bake the bread every day, fresh, like all these things. Um, you, if you're talking about all of that, people are going to want to keep, keep coming. But if it's just constant buy my cheeseburger in my face, you're going to, you're going to lose your peeps <laughs> quickly. <laughs> yes, quickly. So earlier you lightly hit on this and it was how you asked Kelsey for help with your brand for your branding. And I think that that's wildly important that we have coaches, that we have mentors, that we hire somebody to help us. Even if it's the only, like if it's in our lane, sometimes we can't see what's right in front of us when it comes to ourself. So yeah. can you talk about that a little bit, like how that helped either with Kelsey or with, if you have other mentors as well. Yeah. It's um, the same thing on why I know it's so helpful the way I do my process. So all the clients that I work with, we start with a full day discovery. And when I say that people are like a full day, I literally just this morning had a gal go, wait, a full day. Do I really need that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's because what I do isn't creating you. It's pulling you out of you and helping you see everything that I end up creating in these brands stems from you in some way. And it's bringing that to the forefront, talking about it, um, that really helps your brand come to life. And so many people will say, oh, I'm not creative. I don't really, that, that's, that's my place. That's my job. I'll help you take what is so uniquely and authentically you and give it life and make it, you know, quote unquote, creative. Um, and so with, um, and even with Kelsey, if I'm being honest, it's, it was really a cool experience because her first step is this very long questionnaire and my process is different, right? You do have no homework before you start with me. You just know on that day, I'm going to really be pulling it out of you. Kelsey almost fired me twice. <laughs> I, I got two very strong, I might drop you as a client staff conversations from Kelsey. And I know she would, she would be fine with me sharing that, but it was because I really struggled with getting that questionnaire out. I, I it wasn't that I just wasn't doing it. I struggled getting what was in me out when I was left to my own device. Mm, yeah. Um, and so when, you know, you have to one know yourself. So if you're listening to this and you're like, well, I really want to go through this exercise and I want to, you know, get this pulled out of me. You have to know, are you the kind of person where hiring a coach that will have you answer a bunch of questions and fill out a bunch of self, you know, inquiries and that is, is good for you. And that will feel good. Then that's great. 
that is why that exists. And so many people thrive in that way. But if you know that either a, you won't feel like you know what to answer with, or you feel like you're not creative. I'm doing the air quotes again. It <laughs> really has nothing to do with creativity, but people think that, um, if they're, they can't answer these questions, you know, don't have the introspection to do that then maybe working with someone who is more one-on-one and has this length in time where we sit down together and I help pull it out of you or oftentimes give you examples so that you understand what the question even is, you know, one of the hardest questions I ask people is why do you do what you do? And that is a lot of people will stop and they're like, Oh, Oh gosh, she's really asking me. And, and, you know, most of us think, oh, it's for the money, you know, oh, it's because I want to, you know, win a prize or whatever. Well, that's not why we do what we do. You know, that's the result of what we do. Um, so it's, it's a really, um, there's a, there's different ways. I am kind of, I feel like I'm digressing from what you were originally asking, but I, I think what I want people to walk away with is there is no right way to go about it. You do have to, to know yourself or try one. And if it doesn't work, like Kelsey almost fired me and I felt, (laughs) I felt like, oh boy, if she fires me, who am I going to find? But, um, you know, know that there are different avenues on how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that we are all creative because I used to be the person like, nope, I'm not creative. I can't do it. You Mm -hmm. know, but sometimes it takes having a coach or somebody to pull it out of you. And then even sounds like through your process, it can spark creativity in other areas because it really hones in on who you are. Well, and I think with my process, what I hope people walk away with is it feels so good because I didn't create something that didn't exist. If I'm talking about creating a brand that you get to live and breathe for the rest of your existence, I want it to be so authentic to you that it's easy to live. If I just decided, okay, your brand is this and it's cool and funky and really funny, but you're not cool, funky and funny you're going to have a lot of like living up to do to this thing. That's not authentically you. And I know what will happen is either you will, you will fall flat. You won't believe in marketing. You won't believe in branding. And that's the polar opposite of what I want anyone to feel when they work with a coach or work with a strategist or an agency. I want you to not only believe in marketing so much, I want you to believe in yourself and that that is so valuable. Um, So, yeah. So now I should have asked you this before we got up, but did you write a book? No. Okay. Cause I thought I saw something on Instagram about a book or something that was tactical that people could have in their hands to actually look at. Can you tell me about that? Yes. So, um, all of the brand identities, and I know we're not, I know you and I aren't video, but everyone's just listening at home, but all of the brands that we work with, we put them in a hardback book. Um, and it's, it's so fun to be able to have your brand in your hands. You know, we can put swag together all day and make cups and, you know, signs and posters and sweatshirts. And that's, that's good. But to, to truly be able to have your brand in your hand, flip through what you believe in, who you are, your personas, your personality spectrum, this becomes, this book becomes your, you know, your brand Bible, your gut check. You know, you don't put it on the shelf and let it collect dust. Uh, pages inside of this have, I have pages in here where you write down things, templated templates, tear out pages so that you have the most important pieces in front of you at all times. Um, So when you hear me on social talking about new books coming in or me shipping books or publishing books, it is the brands that we work with getting them to this stage. Uh, And of course the book is awesome too. It's great to have. But what's really fun is if we can put a 75 plus page book together, all about your brand, you have all of the assets, all of the digital assets to create this tangible thing. Imagine what else you can create. All of your marketing becomes so much easier because we've created this and now we can really create to our heart's desire. Yes. Oh, to beers, take it from Steph. (laughs) <laughs> something, whether it's a book on your brand of your business or things that are important to you, your values, have them around you, something you yeah. can look at all the time and remind you of your values and what's important to you. So I love that. Thank you. 
So let's end with a tip to encourage women who are in the arena fighting for the life that they want. Ooh, it's a big, heavy tip to provide. No, but I, I really think it's as simple as like, know that whatever makes you as ordinary or as badass as you think that is, own it. Because if you don't own it, then other people who share that with you in some way, whether it's like exactly, maybe not, but in some other way, you're leaving them out. If we all owned our like total ordinary badass selves, then we would all be able to see that, you know, little piece in us and others. And we would build these deep connections um, that I know are going to be like lifelong, loyal, lasting connections. And I just think who doesn't want more of that in our lives? Yes, exactly. So um, Steph, how can we connect with you? I'm on social. I'm most, I'm most authentically and present on Instagram because that's just such a fun platform for me. Um, so I'm on Instagram and Facebook um, at Get Vim. So if you want to get a hold of somebody, it's get Vim. Remember that's V as in visual, I as in intentional, I as in integrated, M as in marketing. Um, or you can find me at getvim.com. So www.getvim.com. Steph, thank you so much. You've been a total badass and I've enjoyed hearing your story. <laughs> thank you for having me. And with that, we'll end our show. To all the badass women out there staying in the arena, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, own it and get after it.